All right, there we go. And today we have got an excellent lineup. Um, here's the plan. Uh, we've got both uh, Brian Capel and Tom Oxley. Hold on a second. I'm hearing myself in the live stream. All right, there we go. Oh, sorry. So we've got Brian Capel talking about Connectomics and DBS, uh, and then followed by Tom Oxley. It's going to be an, a very exciting uh, set of talks here. We're starting with Brian Capel, who's professor of neurosurgery, neurology, neuroscience, and psychiatry. He's director of the Center for Neuromodulation. He's co-director of the Bonnie and Tom Strauss Movement Disorder Center. Um, you can see here from his education, he has sought out additional training to become highly specialized in functional neurosurgery, in standard stereotactic functional neurosurgery, restorative functional neurosurgery, pain disorders. And with this training, he's become a academic and clinical juggernaut and has really built a very uh, busy, burgeoning, um, and well-respected practice uh, that's permitted building uh, research trials and, uh, and leading uh, academics. And we're going to hear today about some of the work he's been doing. Thanks very much, Brian Capel. Thank you very much, Chris. I'll uh, share my screen now. Great. So um, as Chris mentioned, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our group's journey towards connectomic DBS, specifically for the use of obsessive compulsive disorder. Since DBS has been introduced into the modern neurosurgical armamentarium in 1999, there have been a whole host of targets that have been reported used for OCD DBS. Perhaps the most common is the anterior limb of the internal capsule, which is itself a evolution of the capsulotomy of your, but there is a number of other targets as you can see here within the thalamus, uh, within the uh, nucleus accumbens region, even the habenula. And you know, if you look at the results of, of this particular effort, um, they all converge about at a 55% responder rate. And what does a responder rate mean? It means about a 35% reduction in the standard Yale-Brown obsessive compulsive scale. Now, 35% doesn't sound like a tremendous amount, um, but this is a notoriously difficult disease to, to budge, especially when it gets very severe. So when, when you're able to move a patient that severe, 35%, that is actually really life-changing. Um, really quick primer, just to give you background so that you can uh, more appreciate what I'm going to say, uh, mechanisms of DBS, why are fiber tracks important? So as we think about using deep brain stimulation to modulate brain and to change disease, you have to keep in mind that axons and fiber tracts are the most sensitive element to extracellular stimulation. So when we put these electrodes in these various areas of the brain, you really have to kind of think first, what's it doing to the axons and what's the end result to the network? Um, recently, there was a paper by our, um, uh, one of our uh, uh, colleagues um, uh, in, in, uh, in Germany and in, uh, in uh, Amsterdam, who looked at sort of a meta-analysis of all of the available uh, DBS for OCD patients. And they sort of clustered where these lead placements were in a normalized brain, um, and overlaid a, a, a set of tractography on that normalized brain. And what they found was essentially there were two groups, responders that tended to interact with fiber tracts going to the dorsal anterior cingulate and the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, 
And then a more posterior group that tend to interact with fibers going down to the amygdala. But if you look at that sort of data set, it kind of implies that as long as you get anywhere along that red track, which is gonna to go to those two critical cortical nodes, you should be able to target anywhere, be easy. It should be an easy process to target these things, but it's not. You can't just target anywhere along these tracks. There's, there are specific areas. How do we know that? Well, just from experience. So one of the other sort of common themes that we have seen as a field is this interesting march posteriorly from the days of capsulotomy to the days of DBS. And you can see here along that anterior limb of internal capsule, how there has been this inevitable march posteriorly, medially, and sometimes either dorsally or ventrally. And we know that this is more efficient because either the patients get better or the stimulation um, energy needed is less, indicating it's a more efficient target. But then how posterior is too posterior? Because once you cross that anterior commissure, these fiber tracks begin to diverge again fairly rapidly, some going straight to the thalamus, others going to the serotonergic midbrain. So in uh, 2020, our group, uh, led by Martin Fagi and Andrew Smith, took a look at the last cohort of the patients that I've implanted um, for OCD. And what we found in this particular cohort um, was uh, a responder rate of 73%, which is quite a bit higher than what is typically reported. Um, the overall reduction in Y box is the same, however. But we'd like to figure out, well, is this a, just a statistical abnormality or um, is there something else behind here that we could leverage going forward for patients? And so on the right hand side is that once again, that diagram of the responders and the non-responders in relation to these two tracks. And when we tended to uh, lay our cohort onto this same sort of schemata, what was interesting is that our leads tended to be in between these two cohorts for whatever reason. And so what we then said to ourselves, well, aha, maybe there is some sort of tangible anatomical hook that we could leverage and even further develop to make this efficacy rate, this responder rate even better. And this is a sort of an iterative process that this kind of work takes. Um, the initial thing is to establish fields of volume of, of, of tissue activation. And there are models based on gray-white matter density and a given stimulation set of parameters, how much of a volume is likely to be biologically activated by a specific stimulation set. But that only gives you half the story, especially when you're thinking about doing this prospectively. Uh, the next thing you need to then do is take those VTAs and then overlay them on patient-specific white matter maps, specifically fiber tracking um, of the clinical response. And by merging the two, you can actually begin to develop a real prospective strategy of stimulating um, for these network diseases. And taking this all together, this is our way of hopefully really developing an infrastructure of developing prospective personalized targeting. Yes, in OCD, but we're doing the same in movement disorders. And obviously it's the cornerstone of the work that we're doing with Helen in uh, depression. So um, this was 11 patients with treatment resistant OCD that we looked back on, seven males, four female a mean Y box score of 35 and the maximum score is 40. So these are incredibly sick people. And, and our follow-up with each patient now is four years, which is quite a long period of time. So as I alluded to, there's, there's two types of analyses that the group did. An anatomical volume of activation analysis, and then looking at common white matter maps specifically tied to clinical response, not just activation, 
but which ones did better, which ones did worse, and the magnitude of the effect. So first thing was, is that we had to localize the electrodes in the brain. We used a uh, commercially available lead DBS software that, that can help with this. It's open source. It's uh, to a normalized brain. And this uh, p uh, piece of software allows us to feed in the stimulation parameters that are being used clinically in these patients, thus gives us the volume of tissue of activation. And we can then correlate this with the percentage of reduction in the Y box at the last follow-up. <clears throat> so let's look at where this VTA occurred in this patient population along the anterior limb of the internal capsule. And again, we did this in an iterative uh, fashion, patient one, patient two, patient three, we knew what their stimulation parameters are. We feed their location of their electrodes of which contacts are being used and um, what the, and then we get essentially a hot spot of number of voxels of stimulated of, of where the, the, the most likely probability of stimul of, of activated um, uh, tissue of, in these particular patients. And you can see, you know, the yellow area is the most probabilistically high area of activation given the location of these stimulation electrodes and the parameters. Then we can then cor correlate this, not just with the number of area or the area that's being stimulated, but then we can take another look at that same data set and say, well, let's correlate this with how much that Y box scale went down. And in our patient cohort, the best patient had a 71% reduction in Y box. Now remember the average patient is about a 40% reduction. That's a home run. 71 is phenomenal. And Zen zero is obviously considered a non-responder. And it was interesting to us to see how that sort of hot spot moved once you brought in the clinical data, the response data. And it appears that the hot spot, the areas of most uh, activation tend to be more posterior, maybe perhaps a little bit more dorsal. And so we then said, okay, now we're, we can focus in even further on that using tractography analysis. And the, essentially what this distilled down is the area of the highest clinical improvement, the, the, the volume of tissue that tends in a normalized brain now that tends to be associated with not just response, but the greatest amount of response with regards to Y box reduction. And here you can see this, this area at the sort of more ventral and posterior aspect of the anterior internal capsule, just above the most anterior portion of the globus pallidus. So let's now bring in tractography into this. So this was an iterative process where we take responders, that means everybody who got at least a 35% reduction in their Y box scores, they're responders. Everybody else who got less than 35% they are considered non-responders. Rather than averaging them all together, which tends to cause a lot, lot of signal dropout in the tractography work. Tractography is, a, especially probabilistic tractography, is really, really tough to manipulate. You can end up going down a lot of rabbit holes. And, um, and one of the ways that we avoid this is to really just bin responders separately from non-responders and look at what they have, not just average, but in common in terms of what fiber tracks are in fact being activated. And in um, the responder and the non-responder, um, we are seeing, for instance, the following. So in the non-responder group, there is a very unique connection that the responders don't have, and it mostly involves the uncinate fasciculus and the amygdala fugal pathways, essentially amygdala outflow or reception to the cortex in these particular patients. For whatever reason, these patients that tend to not respond, this is where their electrodes are engaging in more so than the responders. 
Conversely, the responder groups have tracks that consistently interact with the dorsal ACC and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the anterior pallidum, and the subthalamic nucleus. This is a consistent common connection that one must have to cross the threshold into being a responder. And so you can really distill this back down to two critical pathways. One that I kind of alluded to at the beginning of this talk, this anterior limb fiber tract that specifically is going to the dorsal ACC and the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And now we're beginning to see a slightly new tract that's coming out, this palatal thalamic tract that you can see in orange over here. Um, we went a bit. We we went a bit further, and we started to you know that's just purely looking at did you respond? Are you having at least a greater than thirty five percent reduction? But then when we tried to even bend it further and look at well, what about magnitude of response? What about the super responders? So here we looked at patients that had at least a seventy percent improvement, and it is pretty clear that the amount of engagement in that frontal pathway going to the VLPFC and the DACC is much, much stronger than the ones that have a, only about a 15% response on the right. Um, looking further down was also kind of very interesting. Um, the ones that did not respond did not have that engagement in that anterior pallidum going into the STN and thalamic regions the way that, that the responders did. So there was this more posterior sort of activation of fibrous tracts, really focusing on that palatal thalamic area. Um, putting it all together, we then asked ourselves, well, maybe if response can happen, if you get some of the green, yeah, you'll probably get some response and very likely you'll get some response in the orange tracts. How do we begin to merge the two in every single patient so that we can get maybe the best of both worlds. Um, the critical connections of this particular frontal connection um, of, these, uh, of these particular cortical regions are essentially what we call the hyperdirect pathway going to the anterior uh, medial STN. Um, the palatal thalamic uh, pathway um, crossing the knee of the internal capsule is on its way to two specific uh, thalamic nuclei, the ventral anterior and the dorsal medial uh, thalamus. Um, and so it occurred to us that perhaps one of the things that has driven the field more posteriorly is this in fact palatal thalamic tract that really adds to the response rate and the efficacy rate. And again, you know, putting this all together, we can sort of see where these two tracks merge and we can begin to, on a personalized basis, see where these tracks are in a given patient and deliberately pick a trajectory and a target point that takes advantage of that. And this is, uh, and this is a work that I, I work with Kisung, our engineer on. We are now doing this in all of our patients. It's unbelievable. Those of you that work with, with probabilistic tractography, man, this is like working with a ham radio. Every one of these patients takes about 12 to 15 hours of just watching your computer crunch the numbers. And the software that is available, it's open source and there's a great community, but like the user interface is, is almost like a new language unto itself. It's just it's not designed to be really uh, for the average clinician. Some of the uh, parameter sets are actually the opposite of what is labeled. You have to learn to use it. And it's, it's just a really hard and laborious process, but I think it's worth it. Um, this is an example how we've begun to use this now prospectively. This is a recent case that we did of a patient with tardive dystonia uh, with comorbid obsessive compulsive disorder. And so we decided to target the anterior medial STN in a way that we were able to pick up 
the uh, palatal thalamic tract in red and with enough stimulation, pick up the yellow fibers, which are those fibers going to the VLPFC and the dorsal ACC. And it's still early on. The ticks are so far um, somewhat modulated, but what was interesting is that the OC phenomenology has really responded first. We will see. So just wrapping it up, I just wanna kind of put it all together since it's always kind of fun to speculate a little bit about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Why is the VLPFC and the DACC really important in this hyperdirect pathway? Essentially, these are the areas that give us conscious control over our behavior. This is the sort of the way that we consciously engage in either uh, repressing pain when we've, you know, we've injured ourselves and we still have to uh, uh, um, essentially perform on, on, on the sports field. Um, these are the areas that we engage in with meditation. Um, but these are really, really important things essentially to act as a conscious break on unwanted behavior. The um, palatal thalamic tract, especially the one involving the associative circuits, is really involved in automatic behavior. So if the other thing is dealing with the stuff that's really under our conscious control, if you had to do conscious control of everything you would do, you would you'd be driven mad. You need obviously a system that once you learn that behavior, it reinforces it continually and allows you to execute on those behaviors in an automatic sort of subconscious way. And that's kind of what the basal ganglia does. Um, it, it allows an automatic execution of sometimes competitive motor and emotional behaviors. And then yes, over time with cortical input into these areas, we can further refine this, but this is sort of uh, a reinforcer of, of, of uh, behaviors that already exist. So I want, you know, to kind of put it together this way. I, you know, I always talk to people that are, you know, the residents about like, what are we doing with DBS? Remember, it, it, most of the time it's, it's 100 or 130 regular stimulation hertz. That's not informational in the brain. There is no neuron that naturally, you know, connects and, and, and communicates with just regular 130 hertz. That's, that's, that's an informational thing. And you can think of normal brain function and in network theory, normal brain function can be thought of as essentially various different um, mathematical states based on all of the pro properties of all the different interconnected areas. And you can think of a normal brain as like a nice flat plane and the behavior, the normal behavior is a ball rolling on that plane. Now, due to either injury or other forms of abnormal neuroplasticity, that flat plane essentially forms a divot, if you will. It's a mathematical divot, but it's still a divot. And essentially that ball, instead of rolling smoothly across the plane, do, letting the brain do its normal function, it gets stuck. And in a lot of ways, a lot of these circuit pathologies are just circuits stuck in a mathematical, what we call a tractor state. Um, that's why I always tell patients, OCD is kind of like the tremor of the limbic circuitry. So it's important to understand, again, if DBS isn't doing something quote informational, it's not like telling the brain, well, you know, washing your hands is completely silly because you've washed it four days ago and blah, 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 blah. No. Essentially, what DBS is capable of doing at greater than 100 hertz, and we know this from basic biophysical experiments, is it tends to desynchronize whatever neural activity that is occurring within the state. And essentially, these attractor states are essentially abnormal synchrony. That's, that's all it can be sort of fundamentally con conceived of within these key subcircuits. So if you put an electrode in into a abnormally synchronized circuit, you provide some partial or complete desynchronization of that abnormal synchrony, then whatever the 
that is left of the brain that is normal will in fact subsume normal activity. So if the problem is in the conscious ability to stop and switch plans, if there is an attractor state there and you desynchronize that, then lo and behold, now you have a greater degree of an ability to um, stop these unwanted think thoughts and actions. And the same thing can be said for an automatic reinforcer of undesired or uh, plans or thoughts. And again, this really comes out in what we see with these OCD patients. It's not so much like a tremor where we turn it on always and they just say, oh, I don't have to wash my hands anymore. In fact, one of the common things is that the behavioral therapies that were before completely useless in these patients now all of a sudden are really, really helpful in these patients. And that implies that that attractor state is gone, that the conscious and automatic uh, inhibition areas are now online and working more properly. They're no longer stuck. And therefore the brain subsumes a more reasonable state. So in conclusion, um, we are beginning to really characterize two important basal ganglia circuits associated with the clinical response. This hyperdirect pathway from the frontal lobes down into the STN area and an associative palatothalamic area. We believe that consistent convergence of these two pathways may be the personalized sweet spot for patients with OCD. And this is our central testable hypothesis for our patient cohort that we are doing in 2022. That's it, thank you. And again, before I go, this is, it takes a village. Boy, does it take a village. It, 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 this, this is a work that cannot simply be done by a single person. It can't be done by two people. There is so much work and so much expertise that needs to come to bear. And um, as to echo Josh's um, sentiment in the time of year, gratitude, boy, every day I wake up with a tremendous amount of gratitude that I see these people day in and day out in my work life. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, if anybody has any questions, raise your hand as an attendee and we'll activate it. I see a few there. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Trevor. Hi, thanks, Dr. Capel. That was a, a great talk. Um, I just had a question related to the uh, study that you did where you had the three non-responders and that was attributed to the amygdalofugal pathway that was being activated. Was there aberrant tractography in those patients that, that such that when you placed the lead that they were, it was catching more of, of that pathway or what was, what was the reason that those patients were having that pathway stimulated versus the, the eight responders? So Trevor, you're, you're, you're um, alluding to two really good potential possibilities. Is there a white matter abnormality in some of these patients that's going to kick them into one direction or another? We don't know yet. We are beginning to examine that very, very issue. Um, the, the, the sort of the more lower hanging fruit is just a, it's a measure of the, of the, uh, the targeting, the targeting. So if you target in a certain way, um, remember a millimeter or two in one direction or another, and especially the angulation, you then pick up one set of fibers over the other. It's all, that's all the difference. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Zimmerman. Hey, Dr. Copel. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a question regarding the reduction in the disease severity, particularly my limited understanding of the Yale and Brown OCD scale is that half of the questions are related to obsessions and the other half are related to compulsions. So I'm wondering if you guys have looked at all if there's asymmetry in the reduction to responders in obsessions versus compulsions, or if it's a one-to-one -one reduction. So again, another really um, great question because it really speaks, you know, to sort of the sort of, if I will, and I'm just going to use the word anachronistic way that we sort of diagnose psychiatric disease in the year 2021, right? Ultimately, 
you know, these circuit pathologies are just based on symptom lists, which is kind of like a very 19th and 20th century way of defining these diseases. And each one of these symptoms, not every single one, but it certainly begs the question, could some of these symptoms be distinct circuits? And your point's well taken. Um, these are other areas that we're be going to begin to look at once we have a little bit more um, confidence that, um, that this approach is going to work. But yeah, again, a really great idea there. Thank you. And we've got a question from Alex Schuper. Um, Alex, I yeah, go ahead. Hey. hey, Jeremy. Hey, Dr. Bell, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I did type a question in the chat box, which was about to talk about how understanding this variability in, in tractography activation can change your actual surgical planning and how much variability you see between some of these OCD patients. And then just a caveat to Jeff's question, can we, have we gone to the point yet where based on their clinical presentation, we can predict variability in, in white tract, uh, white matter tract activation, or are we not there yet? So let me answer the second question first. Uh, we're definitely not there yet. We're definitely not there yet. Um, you know, one of the challenges, because, because tractography analysis is so darn laborious, you know, believe it or not, not a lot of groups are really doing this at volume. So, the, you know, the fact that we're beginning to start to do this at volume is is, is we're sort of on the forefront on it. And um, so we'll see. Um, you know, with regards to personal variability, there's a tremendous amount of personal variability in this particular region. So I could give you two scans where the, let's say you could see where the STN, the GPI, the red nucleus is, and obviously in between them are the tracks there's quite a bit of geometric variability from patient to patient to patient. So, um, you know, I suppose if you really had to, you could develop some sort of very complex, you know, two millimeters in front of the red nucleus in addition to three millimeters lateral to the GPI. I mean, you'd have to come up with some really Byzantine sort of back way of, of, of trying to normalize that from patient, but we don't have to do that. You know, now we can actually just see the patient specific stuff. And yes, indeed, if you look at like where we end up placing the lead from an ACPC normalized coordinate point of view, it really varies from patient to patient to patient. Yes, it's not like, you know, 10 centimeters away, but it is within that area, several, several millimeters. And, and again, this is a game of millimeters. Brian. Brian, after you put a lead in, when do you settle on stimulation parameters? How long does it take you to decide that you've optimized the stimulation parameters for that particular patient's problem? And how long does that take? You have now you have variable leads where you can even change that. Right. How does that work? Right. So, you know, uh, there's an infinite technical space, if you will, Josh, to, to, to you know, explore in this post-op period. It really still comes down to the expertise of our clinical programmers, our neurologists in movement, our psychiatrists in psychiatry. And it's a clinical, it's a clinical judgment of when they think that they are essentially um, at, at steady state. Now, obviously that's not good enough, is it, right? We don't wanna just rely on opinion, right? We want to come up with something more objective. This is the 21st century. So another avenue that is being led by our um, colleague, Allison Waters, is to help us develop high-density EEG uh, biosignals that can help us identify steady states so that we're not just chasing our tails. And then obviously that, could, <laughs> that also could be eventually um, translated to a closed loop system. Right. So on the 71 percenter, did they start out like the day after at 71 percent or did they kind of ramp up as the programmers 
optimized. There's, there's a ramp up. So again, you know, in, the, in psychiatric phenomenology, and not surprising in the sense of like, what is the associative and limbic circuitry, you know, subserving versus like the motor circuitry, right? You know, in some ways, our, um, you know, our experience with movement disorder DBS has been a little bit of, of, of an unfortunate thing. And let me explain to you what I mean by that, because we've all been fooled. You turn on the DBS, tremor just stops dead, right? So when we started to get into psychiatric DBS, first, the, the, you know, the, the expectation is, well, why doesn't it do the same thing? Well, it's because the sort of the time course of these circuits are, are, are not quite as, um, as, as fast, right? You know, your motor circuit is designed, if somebody throws a baseball at you at 100 miles an hour, that you can hit it. That's a very, very short time course. Generally speaking, you don't want your limbic and emotional circuitry to be so dynamic in that way. You know, it, you want there to be a certain degree of stability so that there's a certain slowness to those circuits. That, that's a normal thing. It's a good thing. So in that regards, we have to you remember we're really engaging neuroplasticity. And so there, there has to be a little bit of time. Patients do report some immediate effects but it's subtle. Interesting. There's got to be other questions for Brian or comments from other experts. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Brian, I'm, I'm a fascinating talk, and I think the, the tractography element uh, adds a layer of sophistication to the ability to understand the, the, the process of, of efficacy. You mentioned that there could be some electrophysiological biomarkers that begin to emerge. Um, not, I, I guess my question is, can you give me a sense of what the biomarkers might look like and how you might use them? You mentioned in a closed loop system, but are there ways that they can be used more for targeting? And then you know, how would that differentiate from the use in a closed loop system? Okay, great. Okay. so. You know, I mentioned now, you know, networks, right? Networks consist of nodes, which are generally the way we conceive of it are sort of gray anatomical areas, either the parts of the thalamus, parts of the cortex, uh, the STN, et cetera, et cetera. And then the edges, which are essentially the connections between those are the white matter areas. Okay, fine. So one of the ways you could develop something like a biomarker of targeting is if I put an electrode here at point X, and my goal is to engage and, and at least demonstrate that the electricity is, is hitting, if you will, just from a, from a, from a biophysical standpoint of, of cortical region A, B, and C, you could, you could use that as a biosignal to say, ah, target engagement occurs, right? Just, just from a very basic in the operating room way, you could basically demonstrate that given a placement in, within a fiber tract region, you are in fact reaching these critical nodes of the network that you believe is important to modulate the disease. Not sexy, but it's extremely attainable and, and, and it makes sense from a biophysics standpoint, number one. Then it's the response rate. Now that's where we can really, that, that obviously is a area that's important, but it can be very, very complicated because right now, especially in like movement disorders, people are looking at just sort of bog standard fast Fourier correlations between um, powers in certain frequency domains and symptom relief. Like the big thing has always been the beta peak associated with Parkinson's disease. And for about 80% of the time, that's kind of true, but that's kind of a weak sauce in terms of biomarker. I, you're very likely going to need to have a slightly more sophisticated double correlation between not just power and frequency, but also their relationships in time as well. And so that'll be another area that basically I think that people will have to look into.
Brian, um, I recently uh, got my head around some of the uh, DBS work in memory. Right. And it sounded like uh, there was lateral temporal targeting for your work. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. yeah. Some yeah. kind of uh, reinforcement of memory that occurred with some band of frequency of stimulation. And, and what occurred to me looking at that was the, the, the deep brain stimulation work in Parkinson's has occurred from, as you said, this 130 Hertz, which is a disruption of an abnormal circuit, but this memory work is somehow causing, I guess it's a long-term potentiation or some additive effect. So can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between the understanding mechanisms of how the, how the stimulation, whether it's additive or, or, you know, or, or, or it's, um, you know, uh, j- uh, jarring. Right, right, right. Okay. So, um, as I said to you, once you get above a hundred Hertz, whatever your whatever circuit you're in, you tend to desynchronize. And that's generally because while the axons can fire one-to-one for hundreds and hundreds of Hertz, the axons are great. The problems are the synapses. They're the ones that poop out in a number of seconds because they just can't, um, they can't recycle their, their, their uh, neurotransmitters quick enough. And so as a result, the desynchrony occurs. Okay, but now we have this whole range of lower frequency, um, not only in a, in a regular stimulation pattern, but you know, then you can start to describe pattern stimulation lower than, than you know, so that it gets very complicated. But, well, if you're below the 100 Hertz threshold, then theoretically, instead of desynchronizing, you could potentially be synchronizing aspects of, of activity. If that synchronization is good, well, perhaps we'll be able to help people's memory. We've already known this, believe it or not. What's so fascinating about functional is that there, there literally is no new thing under the sun. Ogerman has these weird papers from these conferences that you can go find where they stimulated in the thalamus um, in patients with tremor, for instance. And we know that the tremor is about four to six hertz. And you can do this in the operating room. If you stimulate at four to six hertz, you can drive a tremor mad. It's just insane. Um, and he was able to actually do some low frequency stimulation in other areas of the thalamus and either improve spatial memory or improve the, um, t- um, abilities and um, language tasks and then show when you go with high frequency, how you can decrement it. So there, there is this whole frequency domain that we can begin to just um, explore. And then if you sort of t- infer from like the TMS literature where patterns of that simulation, theta burst, continuous, intermittent, blah, 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 could have a, a much, much different reinforcing pattern. So that's where you're getting into that very deep end of the pool. But good question. I see that Dr. Mayberg has her hand raised. Helen, do you have a question or comment? I just was going to make a comment. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I could I could go on if you don't need to see me, but I can just talk in the air. Um, but I don't know how to get in. I was just going to say it was really nice um, summary, Brian, of the work you guys have done, and and it's really extended how the whole field has to do this and. I will just want to comment that as you're in this neuropsychiatric space, time, there actually are fast things and slow things and different disorders really have to be dissected into the fast things and slow things. And as a collaborator, you know, time is money for us too. You guys have your time in the OR and you really, it's really about where. And the more that the tractography can help the surgeon to reliably go where and have tolerance limits on the lead, whether it's directional or just the number of contacts. But if you miss, it's over. You know, this is why the psychiatrists spend, they love it, I hate it. The goal is set it and forget it as your goal line and not bragging rights of how many hours it took you to um, tune a patient. That's actually, a mantra, and it's absurd, that you should be able to implant with confidence. And Brian tells me all the time, he doesn't like the fact that it needs a committee to decide how to do the tractography. That's why the clinical trials fail. 
And we've actually reduced to practice with Brian how to actually take our you know, team approach to a kind of three-step localization for depression to actually get it in and reliably know from anatomy we're in the right place. But then importantly, how do you convince others that's true because you're gonna leave that OR? You need a biomarker of target engagement in the OR. And we've been developing that with electrophysiology, but we have a behavioral signal. And yeah, is it subtle? Yes. Is it quantifiable with a general kind of scale? No, it's individual to what someone's experience is when you're in this non-cortical circuit. And once you have that, you can reverse and measure a measurable biomarker might be face. We've tried to reconfigure the OR to look because out of the OR, we can see it and use it as a biomarker or um, blood pressure or pulse or skin conductance. Their you know, heart rate, those are all biomarkers we've also seen for depression. So translating that of these acute effects to then what you do in the lab outside, there are two different parts. There's really surgical optimization and clinical optimization they feed on each other, but actually I think we can get the surgical part done much faster than the clinical optimization. And I think that's how we get it to practice in more people by concentrating first on the where with surgery than on the other. And then we can force in some ways that kind of structured rigor for anatomical constrained biomarkers of behavioral or EFIS or whatever you want to do. And, and that's what Martin and, and Kisung and, and um, Allison are all doing. They're exploring Jousy Goo, all these different ways to measure it. And that's just, the, that's just the mantra of the whole approach, I think, and functional we're trying to do in the neuropsychiatry space with Brian. When are we going to have MRI compatible electrodes so you can check right at the, at the moment? Or would that even help? Well, first of all, we do, Josh. We are now, um, the Medtronic system in particular is fully three Tesla compatible, fully three Tesla compatible, not only in the connected state, but also in the d disconnected state. So you can do experiments. Um, Abbott is the, as the same material stuff. They're going to get the same connect, you know, approval. Um, yeah, it's, it's another avenue that one could potentially use maybe in the operating room to confirm target engagement. Um, you know, you know, MRI has a little bit of its limitations in the sense that it doesn't have quite the temporal resolution that our electrophysiological stuff has, but again, sure. Absolutely. You know, Josh, and, and believe me, it's like, so thank God we have this MRI compatibility. I mean, I mean, when I started, it, it, it was like you had to kind of sneak in after hours. I remember my, uh, Pat Kelly made me go with his patients after hours to, to the MRI um, to, get, to get a scan. And in the morning, the uh, radiologist would call up and just lose their minds, basically. So we don't have to do that under the guise of night anymore. It's, it's, it's actually much better. I had a quick question, Brian, that was a great talk. I uh, really appreciated that. And Helen, I think you answered one of my other questions, but I think, uh, Brian, as you look moving forward here in the field that you're de defining with your team, what opportunities are there for actually redesigning the lead and, and kind of helping you with what you're trying to focus on that, you know, was the basis of your talk. Is there a, an ability to, to, bridge a gap with better lead design? Because I know that's advanced the field in a number of other designs that have come through the years. Right. So, you know, you could, you could trip the light fantastic thinking about the differences between what you could do and et cetera. I mean, and the truth is until we get consistent results with the approach that we have now, you know, in my mind, you know, there has to be a need that technology addresses, right? So we have directional leads, which 
are very, very compelling in terms of what they may or may not do. Because the idea being is that if you place an electrode in a particular fiber bundle area where they're crossing, et cetera, you know, theoretically, one could use the different segments to differentially engage the different circuit, patho- the circuit um, fiber tracks and modulate the circuit in an asymmetric way and maybe have a different behavioral effect. The truth is right now is that that has not yet been proven. So if we can't really, if we we have to really define a need of what these electrodes are and aren't doing, you know, to to, to really put that money in because costs, you know, you know, unlike the spine market or even the endovascular technology market, this, this DBS market has not grown manifestly in years. It's at best a 700, 800 million worldwide market. And that's being shared by at least three major billion dollar companies. And that is a real challenge to put real R&D in certain areas. I mean, it really, really is a challenge. Um, You know, sure. Uh, You know, how about a lead that doesn't break no matter what? I mean, to me, that would be a great thing, you know, or a lead that cannot get infected. Doesn't sound sexy, but that would be really kind of a cool thing. Um, A lead that had a complete MR um, transparency. That would be kind of a cool thing. Um, But other than that, I think it's going to take some time in this sort of iterative process for us to answer that question in a way that really makes sense. Some might feel differently, but that's kind of where I think about it. Also got a question from Neha. Brand, really awesome talk. And as I'm listening to all this, I'm really hoping that in our own lifetimes, we're able to use tractography for patients with the disorders of consciousness and in acute coma care. Any thoughts about how far along are we in trying to be able to do that for patients with disorders of consciousness? Brian Edlow's lab, Kristen Dams O'Connor, they're, they're doing some fantastic work, but we're not anywhere close, as far as I can tell, to, to DBS and coma recovery. Thoughts on that? Well, uh, you know, to sort of prospectively do, like, I, I can imagine, like, you'd want to use that, for instance, let's say a patient gets a head injury, Right. And you would like to then get a scan and look at the sort of resultant damage to the white matter sort of connections of areas of quote consciousness or involving, you know, the reticular activating system. That's going to take like that kind of process would take, you know, thousands and thousands of patients to begin to correlate that with some sort of clinical outcome. What's nice about deep brain stimulation in a way is that it's both therapeutic and investigative because patients can sort of serve as their own control. You know, you can get to some of these answers more quickly. Um, You know, a better person to ask would be like Nico Schiff, who's been working in this for like the last 20 years. And that work has gone relatively slow. And I think it only is because, you know, it, it sort of underscores the complexity and the, the, the slowness of that work. Um, do I think it's possible? I, I, yeah, I do think that that is an, the way that we're gonna begin to sort of prospectively uh, give prognosis to patients in a lot of ways, you know, not just gray white matter. These tracks are so fundamentally important to, to normal brain function. That and along with resting state connectivity, I think should be really, really, um, I think will be important, but you know, being not in that field, um, I suspect uh, I couldn't really speculate at time. Great, looks like, Helen, you have another? I was just gonna make a comment if um, the person that was interested in the, um, the coma and the minimally conscious, I mean, Nico Schiff and um, and the Stanford group actually have a brain initiative D- um, DBS project that isn't going at those people that are, you know, extreme. They've actually um, are now doing it in people that 
have actually recovered, but are actually looking at that same thalamic stim to improve function. And they've done a few cases. And also just if you're interested in kind of discussing it with someone, Tanya Naval, who's my postdoc at SEAC, and she's over at Mount Sinai West. She was Nico Schiff's graduate student. She did lots of work with PET and MR and pharmacology in, um, and many people that didn't get DBS but are in that catchment. So, um, you know, if you're interested in that more, she, um, she's a local resource and I'm sure she'd love to talk about it. She's doing the EFIS on the depression project and she's wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian, for a fantastic talk. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker.